Hi, I'm Robin Roberts, former collegiate athlete and current co-host of Good Morning America. What you're about to see is a short film highlighting a long-standing and paradoxical problem. The passage of Title IX has resulted in a record number of female athletes with a passion for and knowledge about sport. I'm a proud product of Title IX, but ironically, the percentage of women being coached by women has decreased dramatically since Title IX. There's a need for more female coaches in high school and college ranks as role models for their athletes. Watch and see for yourself. Travel, there you go, good defense. Hey. What you're talking about, what you're covering, what you're showing, what we're hearing, that's affecting young kids. It's teaching girls and boys at a young age what's normal. I've had, you know, players that I was recruiting come in my office and go, I've never played for a female coach. And so you, you have to talk them through it and just, you know, gender isn't an issue here. It's, it's about coaching, it's relationships, it's the game. We can be competitive, ambitious, and driven. We can have those adjectives attached to us. I think the problem that we have right now is that we don't have enough men that are advocating for women. They are coaching women, and yet they are not supporting women. They are not supporting women in a leadership role. We need everybody. This isn't a women's issue. This is a societal issue. Prior to Title IX, over 90% of all head coaches in women's sports were female nationwide, and today it's just about 43%. The decline happened years ago. If you look at the data now, we haven't gone up or down in any statistically significant way for 10 to 15 years. Now we really need to turn up the flame and, and see what strategies are really going to increase the percentage of women coaches. All right, ladies. Everybody listen up. How many of you guys did the, try the visualization thing the other day? I did, probably. Ah, okay, a couple of you guys, okay. Let's just do that, okay? You, all right, take a deep breath in. I want you to visualize right now the game that you want to have, your best game that you can imagine yourselves having. Go, 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 winner, go, winner! Man to man, okay? I actually ended up playing high school basketball as an eighth grader, and I started varsity, and my team went to the state tournament and I started falling in love with the game of basketball. My junior year, the Final Four was here and some girls had talked about going over to Williams Arena and watching you know, the teams play. I thought, I can do that. And that's really how I kind of started thinking that I actually can coach basketball. We're gonna have, 43 is their shooter. Okay, so we're gonna have to have you stay back a little bit and maybe not even trap on this side. They're not even really The early stages, I really didn't feel like I had the confidence to actually be a coach, but it always just came to me. And I just always said yes. <laughs> I had a father and a mom who supported her daughter playing in the dirt, riding bikes, and doing all those things. And they embraced that and allowed me to be me, which I think is so important. I was the only girl on boys baseball team when I was 10. You know, sports for me is just, it's just where it's always been. My high school coach, who was a female, really wanted to help me with opportunities for life after high school. And she was the one who directed me uh, that there might be more opportunities in basketball for scholarships. And, and she was right about that uh, and landed a Division I scholarship. I first decided to write Women in Sports Coaching as a way to take all the decades of research around women and coaches, which there is a lot, and distill it into one place. That would be a place where researchers, policymakers, decision makers, and future academics would go for that body of knowledge. Research around women in sport coaching is important for a lot of reasons. It provides us data to make policy recommendations and rule changes. It provides information that we can use to persuade decision makers to make changes. We know that young girls desperately want and need female role models. How was our effort level? Hi. Great job. Because awesome. sport is one of the most powerful social institutions in our society, I mean, kids love sports. And the people that run and coach sports matter to them. So when we see women as coaches in a context that matters to young people, it helps them challenge stereotypes about gender and leadership. 
Females in general, I think oftentimes we put ourselves in that person's shoes more. I'm not a guy, so I don't know if they do or they don't. But I often think of things in terms of how is this person viewing this or how is this person perceiving this um, to make sure I understand their perspective. Women need more role models. We need to be able to look up and see somebody that looks like us. I think it starts in Hollywood. You go to the movies, you see these things on TV, and you're looking and seeing, where are the women? You have to see it. If you don't see it, you're not going to believe it. With like discipline, with timing, knowing you're going to deliver the ball at a certain time. I think I've been really blessed to have good coaches that are both male and female. But there was something about you know having that connection with my female high school coach who coached basketball and softball. As a young person, you know I had those thoughts that I wanted to be like her. I, I liked the way she did things, and I wanted that opportunity and. Matter of fact, she was one of the ones uh, when I was graduating college who was inviting me to be a part of that with her. So you could kind of see the snowball effect of having someone that I could look at and say I could be like, and then also you know, a woman giving another woman an opportunity. I think those are two really powerful things. In every other workplace, having a diverse and gender balanced workforce is really important. Athletics is behind the eight ball here. We're really lagging behind. You know, a barrier that I didn't pay a lot of attention to it, but I knew was there, was just how you are valued and judged. Walk into the gym, I coach with my husband. They would go directly to him. Coach, how you doing? He would laugh. She's the head coach. Today, two and a half generations removed from Title IX, only 2% of all head coaches in men's sports are female, and they are always in men's non-revenue sports. Women have not penetrated men's sports, if you will, as head coaches, but men have flooded the zone, if you will, with respect to women's sports. That said, I'm not saying that men should not be head coaches of women's sports, but when over 60% of all head coaches in women's sports, especially at the elite levels, are male, I think something is going on beyond a random occurrence. I think when you're looking at why women aren't being recruited and hired, one of the reasons it's the people in positions of power and their conscious and unconscious bias around hiring and recruiting practices. Well, I think when a men's job opens, um, they hire a firm. When a women's job opens, they wait to see who applies. Athletic directors are the key decision makers in terms of who gets hired and fired as head coaches. And Dr. LaVoy and I did a study recently in which we asked Division I female athletic directors and male athletic directors, why is it that you think women are not being hired because we can show empirically this dramatic decline? And what we found was that male and female athletic directors both agreed that time constraints placed on women due to family obligations was top of mind. The thing that they disagreed on was that men said that women don't apply and there weren't enough applicants, while women said it was the good old boys network and unconscious and conscious discrimination. So you had female AD saying it was structural, you had male AD saying it was the fault of individual women, and then you have a scholar like myself and Dr. Lavoie and others saying what it really has to do with is power. Look no further for me than, than my WNBA career in that the barriers that existed for a long time in the WNBA were that being a woman, um, your qualifications weren't necessarily this, the same or viewed as the same as possibly um, male counterparts in that there was a long time in our league that it was viewed that a former NBA player, coach, would be a better option than maybe someone who had lived a career in women's basketball. I had 12 years of college coaching experience prior to the WNBA. I spent 10 years as an assistant coach. And in that 10 years, I worked for, uh, for men who, who believed that we needed to pay our dues, uh, that women needed to learn how to be pro coaches. I'm a big, big believer in having role models in the department. And I want our student athletes to see people like them in leadership roles. 
I think it's important for women athletes uh, to see people who, who are successful, and there's no doubt in our mind that, that women coaches can win and they can win at a high level. I think we need more women of color coaching. I think the willingness to reach out and talk to other coaches I think will help, uh, but we've got to keep them in the game. When you look at our teams uh, and the diversity that we have across the country, we need to match that diversity on our staffs. For women coaches of color, they face a double bind. They face the, the gender bias and a racial bias. And so, depending on one's intersectional identities, whether they're a mother coach, a lesbian coach, a female coach of color, or all the above, these women might face multiple levels of oppression that make it more difficult for them to succeed in the coaching profession. Faith Johnson Patterson is arguably the most successful coach in Minnesota girls high school basketball history. For the past two years, she's worked as Eden Prairie's head coach, but that quietly ended in June, and the school still hasn't said why. I'm the only female on the staff. I'm an African American in on the staff at this high school. I am definitely being treated differently. He literally told me to my face, he didn't think I was tough enough. He said, look at you. You don't look like you have the energy to take this job on. I'm looking at him like I'm a Hall of Fame basketball coach. You have no idea what I've been through. They don't want to respect that, see that, because I believe because I am who I am. At that point, I said to myself, it's on. there's an incredible lens on a female coach, that they are investigated, interrogated, criticized more than the men. I do, I do feel that. I've always been competitive. I've always wanted to be first. I wanted to be the best. I look at things that men can say to their teams that women could really not get away with. And I think I just reached that point of enough. That's got to change. And if I throw my jacket and a male throws his jacket, it should be the same. It has no gender to it. Uh, it's about competition. It's about sport. Um, and it's about not getting our way. <laughs> Once people are aware that they have bias, they can learn to sort of minimize the effects of their own bias. Athletic directors in positions of power, who are mostly men, often blame the lack of women coaches on women. They don't apply, there's not enough in the pipeline, they aren't competent enough, and they lack confidence. So these blaming narratives, that you're blaming the people with no power in the system, you don't have to interrogate the structure. You don't have to look at yourself and say, how am I part of the problem? Because you're just pointing the finger at women. There's a lot of things that we can do. First of all, we need all decision makers and those in positions of power to undergo bias training. We need to offer all women coaching education. We need to interview every female that applies for a coaching position. Coaching directors and athletic directors should require that you at least have one female on every coaching staff. It's a priority for us. And so that's one of the things that within our conference, we're trying to make uh, some significant changes. One of the things that we recently did was we created a female assistant coaches website where we are listing every one of our female assistant coaches uh, on a site. And when a job comes open, I'm emailing that information to our athletic director to say, here's a pool of candidates, go after them, ask them to apply because that's one way that we're going to be able to make those numbers increase, and it's the right thing to do. Use it! You got to get her inside, get her inside! I had a lot of time to process and think, and I thought, God, you know, this is very important how I handle this personally for myself, but I have accomplished so much in this game. You have to push through those tough times. Exciting enough, I'm actually still coaching, and I was pretty much near retirement. But when I got the call, and I thought, here, another chance to impact, another purpose. Defense! 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 We need to give that torch to somebody else that's gonna to continue to pass that along, especially for women. I think when Pat died, I felt a loss. I felt a loss of 
just, who's bringing us together? After I said some things that I've believed for so long, I thought, why not me? I want to hear echoes across the country from women who are feeling the same way. My hope for this future is that women coaches within the culture of sport feel valued, safe, and supported. In the last seven years, maybe the biggest successes that I've had a chance to be a part of is winning WNBA championships in four of those seasons. So there's successes on the court, and, and those are you know, the pinnacle uh, to be able to say at the end we were, we were the best. The challenge of the playoff series, the ups and downs, and the, what you learn from that, what you learn about yourself, how you need to improve, that's what this is about, opportunity uh, for girls and women to do what they love. The most important thing for me is that moment when you see a player who has hit their potential. Maybe it's one play in a game, maybe it's an entire game, and you can see in their face they've done it. And you just see them walk a little taller, have a little more confidence, maybe even get a swagger. I love that moment. I love to see that with each individual player. It happens at a different time. And two years ago, it kind of happened for the whole team, and that was definitely one of the best memories ever. <laughs> That was amazing, and that was huge. Yes. You guys toughed that out. We were down look, by five with less than two minutes to go. You know that, right? God, we're so proud of you guys. That was amazing. Yes. And that was definitely a team effort, guys. <laughs> Man, nice job. It has always looked like for me when my athletes are happy, when they get their heart's desire. There's more things that are more important than winning, and that for me was their confidence, feeling good about themselves. I've had 24 athletes receive a Division I scholarship, totaling over $3 million. And to see their lives change by them getting a free education, getting a master's going on and, and doing great things and becoming role models themselves, is the most incredible thing. Those are lifelong lasting things that mean more to me than the game itself. As my dear friend, the great Pat Summit said, it is what it is, but it will be what you make it. Everyone can do something and there's a toolkit for you to help. Thank you for watching.